If you look at the skulls of a pre-industrial human, you'll see that their skulls are way different than our skulls right now. But if you were to find one of these humans and bring them back to life, and you were to dress them up in a Burberry t-shirt and some fancy pants, you don't even have to get that fancy, but you were to put them on a subway, you wouldn't be able to recognize that they're from the 14th century. They would look like, just like us, except that they're more attractive. So what differences did humans back then have compared to us? Well, one thing is they had more spacious jaws. Their jaws were wider. And they were so wide that they were able to house all of our teeth, including our wisdom teeth. You know how many times we've heard that people need to get their wisdom teeth out. You watching, you might be one of them that had to get their wisdom teeth taken out. But people back in this time, they did not get impacted teeth like we do today. And they did not have to get surgeries to get their wisdom teeth taken out. And also, they didn't have crowded teeth either. So they never needed braces. And even if they wanted braces, they didn't even, didn't even have the option. But all their teeth magically came into the right position. So that's kind of weird, right? But if you look at the fossils from back then, and you look at what has changed over the centuries, you can see what changes in our environment have caused those changes. Even a Stanford evolutionist by the name of Richard Klein, he is a top expert in our species fossil records. He even said that he has never seen an early human skull with crooked teeth. So before I get into what changed in our environment, I want to talk a little bit about genetics. So many people are really quick to blame their genes. They say, oh, I got my crooked teeth from my parents, or I got my small mouth from my dad, so I got my dad's teeth, or something like that. But if you look at our ancestors, they did not have these problems. And if you go by genetics, genetics cannot change that quickly. And all the evidence shows that our jaws and our facial structure and the way our faces have changed, you cannot trace it to a change in genetics. Rather, you change it to a change in our culture. So you can trace it to changes in things like the changes in what we eat, changes in how we're eating, like how we're, our tongue moves and we're eating and how our chewing has changed, and also where we're living. So again, going back to genetics, if you compare us to our Neanderthal men, which is 40,000 years ago, our genetic integrity is about 99.7% the same. So in those 40,000 years, our genetics has, has only changed 0.3%. So a lot of the modern health problems that we get, that our ancestors did not, did not get, are not genetic. So if it's not genes, it has to be things in our environment that actually prevent our genes from fully expressing. So this is the difference now between our genotype and our phenotype. So our genotype is something that cannot change. And this is what has changed only 0.3% in the last 40,000 years. And this is the genetic makeup of an organism. And you get this from the DNA you get from your parents. Our phenotype, on the other hand, this is something that can change. And this is what is expressed from these genes. So your genes give a code and then your phenotype takes that code and expresses it. And that is what is shown, what, what people look like. And the ways that the, you, and the ways that your phenotype can change is there's plenty of different ways. It can be from stress. It can be from nutrient deficiencies. It can be from problems with development of the fetus. So if someone is pregnant and they start drinking alcohol or they start smoking, right off the bat, that baby is at a disadvantage because the phenotype will change because something in the environment has blocked that baby's genes from expressing fully. So that just kind of, just to give you a little background on the difference between our genes and our phenotype. When people say that, oh, they have bad genes, it's really not the genes that are the problem, it's your phenotype that is a problem. And these changes that happened to our jaws, they were very slow. They didn't happen overnight. So it started around the time people began to settle down and they stopped their hunter-gathering lifestyle. And they started practicing agriculture. And this change happened gradually. It actually took 10,000 years for this change in our jaws to happen to what it is now. But right now, it is a huge problem. And I see this all the time. 
about 70% of the people that walk into my clinic, they have changes in their facial structure that I notice, and I'm one of them. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I had really crooked teeth when I was a kid. And they were so crooked that my orthodontist wanted to extract four of my premolars. And they took out four of my premolars and they kind of made everything straight. And this is a very norm in orthodontics nowadays. But now we're starting to see some of the repercussions that can happen when you constrict everything like that. One of the things that can happen is it can keep your airway constricted. And when you go through these braces, it can even cause more issues with your airway. Now, there's a lot of debate on this in the dental community, so I'm not going to dive too much into it, but it can even play a part potentially in sleep apnea. And when you look at the changes in the jaws, one thing that we can see is different from us now versus our ancestors is the way that we're breathing. So a lot of the westernized people have become mouth breathers, where they need to regularly breathe through their mouth instead of their nose, like we were designed to do. And what can happen is when you are a chronic mouth breather is it can change the shape of your face. Over time, as your mouth is always open, it can start to make your face more narrow and it can make your face more elongated, but also it can constrict your airway. So constrict your breathing tubes and basically make it harder for you to breathe. And this is what can contribute to sleep apnea and a lot of other chronic diseases that we're seeing from simply having smaller jaws. And this is something I didn't learn about a lot in dental school. Actually, we hardly touched on this subject at all. I actually started learning about this more after dental school when I started taking my own CE courses or continuing education courses. And this is where I got so interested in it because I saw that even I was affected by this. And so many people now and in the future are gonna continue to be affected by it. And more people are gonna continue to get sleep apnea, insomnia, ADHD, and other diseases that are all related to this. And I'm not here to bash on orthodontics as a profession or anything like that. I think there's a definite need for orthodontics. And especially now with the amount of crooked teeth and stuff we're seeing, I think that it definitely helps a lot of people. And I refer a lot of patients to my orthodontist. But the goal with orthodontists, I think, should be more functional rather than just trying to get people a Hollywood smile. Because this is where it's really hard to find an orthodontist that thinks more functionally than aesthetically because a lot of people just want to go to the orthodontist and get straight teeth, whatever that takes. So if this involves just getting your teeth straight no matter what the cost, so including if you have to extract premolars and constrict everything just to make sure everything is straight, um, that's one way of doing it. But another way of looking at it is how can we make sure that this person is able to chew functionally and also breathe properly after we work on them? So it's not just about aesthetics, it's also about their function. Now, there are some cases where it's pretty much impossible to avoid dental extractions to straighten the teeth. Now, there are still some debates behind that, but sometimes it might be better to have crooked teeth and keep them that way rather than going through braces or Invisalign and trying to get a straighter smile but possibly causing issues like sleep apnea or making it harder for you to breathe. Now, going back to our ancestors versus us now, not all evolution is for the best. And this is more of a cultural evolution because, again, the evidence shows that the genes are not what has changed. But this cultural evolution is actually doing more harm than good. It's actually not doing any good whatsoever. And there's a lot of evidence that these changes in our jaws can contribute to a lot of other diseases we have today. This includes sleep apnea, obesity, ADHD, heart disease, eczema, allergies, lowered IQ, depression, and even Alzheimer's. All of these are symptoms of having a smaller jaw on top of being more unattractive. Now, when I say being attractive, what do I exactly mean? because I wasn't there 40,000 years ago to take pictures of these people and rate them on a scale of 1 to 10, right? So what I mean is one having a healthy face. So we are hardwired genetically to be attracted to healthy people and people who look healthy and look symmetric overall. And socially, when you look at someone that has a wider jaw and a stronger jawline, this is what's considered to be healthier than someone who has a more narrower face and a more recessed jaw or where their chin is kind of pushed back. Now, the other part I mean about our ancestors being more attractive is 
everything was just more symmetrical. They had room for all their teeth. Their teeth were perfectly shaped. They also had wider faces. They had higher cheekbones. All the things that we check off on the boxes of a healthy face today, they had. Also, if you look at cartoons, you'll see that cartoonists, when they want to depict a very dominant, strong male, they will depict them with a very strong, exaggerated jawline. So it just kind of further shows how our jaws can determine our attractiveness. Also, having a more square-shaped or a wider face can play a part socially in a lot of other ways. Researchers from the School of Business at the University of California at Riverside, they found that men that have wider faces were stronger negotiators. And they also tended to have a signing bonus of about $2,200 more compared to people with narrower faces. If our ancestors had these attractive faces and genetics did not change, is there a way to reverse the damage that we've done to our faces over the last centuries and actually make us look more attractive? Well, surprisingly, there might be. So most of the changes that happen to our jaws happen as our jaws are developing. But it still might be possible to improve our appearance, and that is by changing the environmental cues that cause those changes and allow us to have potentially wider faces and a stronger jawline. So in a nutshell, there's a few things that you have to do to improve your facial structure and improve your appearance. So the first is gonna be breathing through your nose. So you need to breathe through your nose at all times. We're gonna get into that in just a little bit. Also working on your posture and also strengthening your jaw muscles. So there are a ton of benefits we get from breathing through our nose. And yes, it can change your appearance. So there was a guy whose name is James Nestor. He's actually a journalist. He wrote a book called Breath and he did this experiment where he blocked his nose for 10 days straight. So he put these silicone plugs in his nose and he put this tape over it. So he was forced to breathe through his mouth for 10 days straight. And when he was doing this, he was tracking his sleep and he was tracking a different biomarkers for his health. And the results are pretty interesting. So he found that immediately he started snoring and he started having sleep apnea. So he didn't have any sort of apnea or any sort of snoring before, but instantly he started snoring four hours throughout the night and he had sleep apnea, actually pretty severe sleep apnea. Also his blood pressure went up, his other biomarkers for health went down. So generally he became unhealthier and he even mentioned how his doctor described how he looked and he basically said that he looked like crap. So there are some other studies that look at switching people to mouth breathers instead of being a nose breather in just their sleep. And again, in these studies, they found that their sleep quality went down, their sleep apnea levels skyrocketed, and there's other studies where people went from having no sleep apnea to all of a sudden having very severe sleep apnea just because they were breathing through their mouth instead of their nose. So we know that if we're not sleeping good, we're not gonna look good, it's pretty obvious. So a simple solution to start breathing through your nose is at nighttime, make sure you're using a mouth tape and using a nasal dilator. So there's a couple of different types of nasal dilators you can use. You can use either a nasal dilator strip that goes over your nose and kind of expands your nose and expands your nasal passages, or you can use an internal dilator, which is something that kind of clips on in the inside of your nose and expands your nose that way. Both of them will work, whichever one works better for you. The plastic one is one that I personally like better because it's easier to put on but it can also rip off your skin, or if you use lotion, it might not stick so well, so whatever works better for you. Now, I did make other videos kind of going more into detail on how you can properly do this, and for example, if you have a blocked nose, how to unblock your nose, there's an exercise you can do, and all the benefits you get from doing this, I'm gonna put a link in the description below, because I'm not gonna go over all of them in this podcast, but the second thing that you wanna do, and this is one of the most important if you wanna improve your appearance, is to improve your posture. Now, specifically, I'm talking about your tongue posture. Now, there are some specific tongue exercises you can do, but basically what happens is when your tongue falls to the bottom of your mouth, like when you're a mouth breather and your mouth is hanging open, your tongue will start to pull your jaw down because your tongue is what holds your jaw up. So if your tongue is resting against the roof of your mouth, it's gonna pull your lower jaw up, and this is also in turn gonna keep your head up. 
But when you become a mouth breather and your mouth is always hanging open, now your jaw is always going to be pulled down and then your head is going to be pulled forward because your jaw and your tongue muscles are relaxed. And this can have really detrimental effects on your posture because your head weighs 12 pounds. But every inch that your head falls forward, that adds 10 pounds to your neck and your shoulders. So let's say your head starts falling forward three inches. That's a 42 pound head you have on your shoulders. And then what happens is your shoulders will start to roll forward and you'll have what's called a forward head posture. And you probably know what I'm talking about because so many people have this where their heads are chronically forward. And this could be because of a lot of different problems with their posture. You know, we have a lot of problems now with people, how they're sitting at desks all day long. I am a dentist, so I know about terrible posture because whenever I practice, my posture is terrible. And a lot of times now we'll see this forward head posture where people's heads are forced to be forward. Well, your tongue plays a huge part in this. We already kind of described how your tongue is attached to the floor of your mouth and therefore attached to your jaw. So if your tongue is instead resting against the palate or the roof of your mouth, it's going to force your lower jaw to stay up and also keep your head back. And also your tongue is attached to your neck. Your tongue is basically a big cluster of muscles and part of those muscles will attach to your neck muscles. So if you're able to strengthen your tongue, you're also going to be able to strengthen your neck muscles. This is going to help keep your head on straight and help with your overall appearance. So one exercise you can do is practice trying to hold your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, but push it up against the roof of your mouth for two minutes. Now, when you do this, you want to make sure that not just the tip of your tongue is touching the roof of your mouth, but also the middle of your tongue and the back third of your tongue. That back third is going to be the hardest part. You don't want it to touch your incisors because if you start pushing your teeth, your teeth can start to flare out over time. You want the tip of the tongue to be touching that kind of rugged part of the roof of your mouth. And then the middle of your tongue should be touching the roof of your mouth. And in the back third of your tongue, this is going to be hard, but you want the focus on getting this up to the roof of your mouth as well. And when you do this, you want to push up for two minutes as hard as you can with your tongue. Then after two minutes, you want to use only half the amount of force, but keep pushing your tongue up against the roof of your mouth. Do that for another two minutes and then half the force again, and then do it for another two minutes and then keep doing it. And then eventually you'll get to a point where your tongue is kind of naturally resting against the roof of your mouth. And that is a position you want to keep your tongue at all times. And that is going to be the correct posture for your tongue. Now, there are some reports of people that can actually change the shape of their jaws and change the shape of their face many years later on in life, many years after their jaws are supposed to be done developing by simply doing this and practicing this. So this was actually developed by a doctor named Dr. Mike Mew. And he studies something called orthotropics. Now, that is basically a branch of dentistry where you specialize in correcting people's jaw posture. And you might have heard this name because of a term called mewing. And this is basically what mewing is, where you're keeping your tongue in a proper tongue posture. Now, an other exercise you can take from this is focusing on that back third of your tongue. Remember I said that that's going to be the hardest part to get up against the roof of your mouth. So what you might find is when you push this back third of your tongue up against the roof of your mouth, it might start to cut off your breathing a little bit. So in that case, you want to move it forward just slightly so that it does not impinge on your breathing. But what you can do is you can start to move this tongue back and forth to where first it starts to cut off your breathing and then it goes forward to its correct position. And if you keep doing this back and forth motion, you will start to get more control over that back third of your tongue. And this is going to help control where your tongue is supposed to be so that over time, naturally your tongue is going to be in the right position. Now, one reason that this works, especially when our jaws are developing, is that as our tongue is pushing against the roof of our mouth, then it'll stimulate our palate to expand. And this is what can contribute to that wider jaw. And this will also contribute to having enough room for all of our teeth. But the problem is when your jaws are done developing, then your jaw cannot move anymore because there's a suture in the middle of your palate. And that's where that bone will start to expand from. And what happens is during puberty, that suture in the middle of the palate will basically fuse and it's going to become impossible for that palate to expand, usually without surgery. But again, like I said, there are reports of people who are practicing this method of keeping their tongue against the roof of their mouth and able to actually change their facial structure. 
I personally think that it will have a lot of benefits. I don't know if it will actually change your bone structure, but it can definitely change your musculature around your jaws and still have a lot of effects with your appearance. And another exercise you can do is basically a natural neck lift. Again, this is going to be involving your tongue. This might be a bit of an annoying exercise, so I would probably do it when you're away from other people. So you're going to put your tongue again in that proper posture where it's resting against the roof of your mouth and the middle and the back part of your tongue are also against the roof of your mouth. And then you're going to widen your smile. So basically have like a really wide smile and then slowly let your lower jaw drop until your tongue falls from the roof of your mouth. So it's going to look kind of like this. So you can see it's making that snapping sound. That's a sign that you're doing it correctly. But if you do that for about 20 to 30 times a day, two times a day, this can start to give you a natural neck lift because what you do is when you're engaging a really big smile, you're also engaging your neck muscles. Because what you do is when you're having that really wide smile and you're opening your jaw like this, you're strengthening your tongue, but you're also strengthening your neck muscles. And this is gonna help keep your head up in the right position. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about with your tongue is when you're swallowing. When you're swallowing your food, I want you to focus on what your tongue is doing. So take a sip of water or try swallowing your saliva right now and see what your tongue normally does. Ideally, what your tongue should do is your tongue should sort of roll back and basically roll across the roof of your mouth and also push that bolus of food down your throat. So your tongue should be doing most of the work when you're swallowing. And if it's not, then you have a bad posture with your tongue. Now, if you do all of these exercises and you keep your tongue to the roof of your mouth at all times, it's gonna really help, first of all, strengthen your neck and your tongue muscles, but also prevent your head from falling forward. And it's really gonna help your overall body posture. But also this will help you with your nasal breathing because when you have your tongue resting against the roof of your mouth, then it's gonna be basically impossible for you to breathe through your mouth. I can try it right now. I can't do it. So not only will this tongue position help with your overall posture, potentially improve your facial structure, but it'll also improve your breathing overall. And some people have this problem where when they're trying to keep their lips together, they start clenching their teeth because that's the only way that they can keep their lips closed and the only way that they can breathe through their nose. This tongue posture can help with that because instead, when you keep your tongue against the roof of your mouth, you're still pulling your lower jaw up, but now your teeth do not have to clench. And your teeth ideally should be basically barely touching each other, but not clenching each other. Another interesting thing about your tongue is one of the prime reasons people are picky eaters or picky to certain textures is because they have bad chewing and swallowing posture early on. And these foods that they're picky to become hard to eat and they start rejecting them because they have this aversion to them. So potentially if you correct your tongue posture, you might find that you're not as picky of an eater. Now, another thing to improve your appearance overall, another exercise you can do is improving your masseter muscle, which is basically your chewing muscles. So this is gonna be basically affecting the outside of your face. When you talk about improving your tongue posture, it's gonna improve more of the inside of your face. And if you improve the chewing muscles, this is gonna improve the outside of your face here. So a simple way to do this is to chew more gum. So every time you eat, after you eat, a good idea would be to chew gum. Not only does this stimulate saliva, and it also can help clean your mouth a little bit, it will also help strengthen your muscles in your jaw. Now, if you have some sort of TMJ pain or problems with your jaw joint, you might wanna avoid doing this until you get those issues resolved. But another thing you can try is something I found online called the Jawser size. So this is basically something that you can start biting on, but it's a way to actually improve your facial structure by strengthening those muscles of chewing. Now, another thing is to start eating tougher food. So stop eating super soft food diets, like stop eating liquid diets, stop eating foods that do not require much chewing, but foods like carrots or celery or harder, tougher meats would be really good as well. So one thing you might notice when you do these tongue exercises is you might find that you have a tongue tie. Tongue tie is basically when you have this really long attachment from your tongue to the floor of your mouth. Now everyone has this attachment, but when this attachment is too long, 
then your tongue can become sort of glued to the floor of your mouth. So just to show what I'm talking about, I have this attachment. You can see it right there. If you weren't able to see it clearly, I'm also going to provide a picture as well to help. But some people might need a tongue tie surgery, which is a very simple surgery, but all it does is when you clip or sometimes people laser that attachment, so that will give you more freedom with your tongue. So the thing with this surgery is it does not work if you do not use your tongue. So if you get your tongue tie lasered and you get more freedom with your tongue, but you keep doing this poor posture, then scar tissue will come and that tongue tie will come back and it might come back even worse. So it's really important that you do these tongue exercises and they might even give you more tongue exercises if you do decide to get a surgery because you wanna make sure that you're using your tongue properly. Now, a majority of people will not need a tongue tie surgery, even if they have a tongue tie. And a simple way to test if you have enough room with your tongue is this two finger test. So put your tongue up against the roof of your mouth, again, with that proper posture, and see how far you can open your mouth and see if you can fit two fingers in your mouth while that tongue is against the roof of your mouth. Obviously, you wanna make sure you have clean hands when you do this, but it's gonna look kinda of like this. If you can fit two fingers in your mouth while your tongue is resting against the roof of your mouth, then you should be good and you probably do not need this tongue tie surgery. It would make sense that if you want to improve the facial structure of someone or if you want to prevent a lot of issues later on, that it would be best to do it as someone's jaw is still developing and before they hit puberty. So as early as possible. There was a dentist by the name of Dr. Weston Price and he was practicing in the 1930s and he was investigating the cause of facial changes and crooked teeth in different countries and different civilizations. And he found some interesting results. So he visited the Gaelic people living on the Hebridean Islands off the coast of Scotland. And he found that children started becoming mouth breathers after their parents switched their diet from their normal natural diet, which was seafood and oatmeal, and they switched them to the more modernized diet, which was angel food cake, white bread, other types of white flour, marmalade, canned vegetables, fruit juices, jams, and confections. Just sounds unhealthy, right? So it's pretty evident that for a lot of people that have crooked teeth and narrower faces and smaller jaws compared to our ancestors, that they have become mouth breathers and this mouth breathing is what has contributed to a lot of these anatomy problems. And the thing is that these changes in our diet and other changes, well, they will affect our breathing first, and that will in turn lead to a whole downstream of other issues. So it's estimated that right now, 50% of children are mouth breathers. And I can tell you that in some communities that is way higher. For example, my patient population that I see, I would say about 70 to 75% of the people that I see especially the children that I see, are probably mouth breathing. And there's some very clear-cut signs that will tell you that. Now, humans were meant to breathe through their nose, and pretty much any animal is meant to breathe through their nose, and we're the only animal that does not breathe through our nose regularly, especially westernized humans. And when we are breathing through our nose, our tongue is supposed to be resting against the roof of our mouth, or in other words, the palate. And when our tongue is resting against the roof of our mouth, especially as we do this at an early age, our palate will kind of follow the shape of our tongue. And this tongue provides a stimulus for our palate to grow. So when our tongue rests against the roof of our mouth, it will stimulate our palate to grow forward and grow wide. So this is why so many of our ancestors and why pretty much none of them had narrow jaws because they were all nose breathing and they had correct tongue posture. And this is why their airways were so open, why they were able to breathe so much more efficiently than us. Because instead, when we become mouth breathers and our mouth is hanging open, our jaws become more narrow and our tongue never touches the roof of our mouth and our palate never gets that stimulus to widen and to expand. And our jaws stay more receded because they do not grow forward and this will constrict our airways constrict our breathing, and also not give enough room for those teeth to come in and cause those crooked teeth. So it makes sense that if you were able to correct these changes early on in a child, that they may not ever need braces. And 
they may not ever have a breathing problem like sleep apnea or snoring, etc. So what else causes us to become mouth breathers? We talked a little bit about the diet, and I'm going to talk more specifically about how the diet can contribute to us becoming mouth breathers later. But other issues are having airway blockages, so like enlarged tonsils and adenoids, which is basically these lymph tissues that are in the back of your mouth. Also, nasal septal deviation. So if you ever broke your nose or have a deviated septum, this is another reason. Also, being tongue-tied, we talked a little bit about that, but basically when your tongue is glued to the floor of your mouth, also having allergies or nasal congestion could also just be habitual. So if kids grow up and they have none of these problems, but they habitually see their parents breathing through their mouth, they're going to try to copy them. That's what kids do. They try to copy people around them. That's why you're not supposed to swear in front of kids. But they can habitually copy them, and then they can start mouth breathing. The interesting thing is, a lot of these reasons for becoming a mouth breather can be corrected by simply using your nose to breathe. You might be looking at me like, well, I have a deviated septum, so how am I supposed to correct that by breathing through my nose if I can't even breathe through my nose? Well, 60% of people have a deviated septum, but a majority of them are still able to comfortably breathe through your nose. So just because you have a deviated septum, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world and you cannot breathe through your nose. Obviously, there are some exceptions that I can get into that more in a different video. But also, for example, if you have large tonsils and adenoids, that can be prevented by breathing through your nose. If you breathe through your nose at an early age, your body will produce a molecule called nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide is an antibacterial molecule that can help prevent these tonsil and adenoid infections. And also when you breathe through your nose, you're more likely to engage your diaphragm. So your diaphragm is this muscle that rests underneath your lungs, and you should be engaging this every single time you breathe. And I can get more into doing that in a different podcast. I'm not focusing on that exactly right now. But when you engage your diaphragm, that also drives the lymph in your body. So your tonsils and your adenoids are these lymph tissues in the back of your mouth. And when you engage your diaphragm, it starts to drain the lymph out of all the tissues, including your tonsils and your adenoids. But instead, when you do not use your diaphragm, then you're not able to drain that lymph. And those tonsils and those adenoids are more likely to get swelled up. So you can see why simply breathing through your nose more can prevent a lot of these issues that cause someone to become a mouth breather. So as I said before, with kids, their jaws are still developing, so it's really important to enact any changes early on. But before you do any of these changes that I'm gonna recommend, make sure you talk to your doctor about any suggestion and talk to them beforehand and see if this is a safe thing to do with your child. So really correcting tongue posture and correcting your facial structure and preventing issues like having a narrow mouth can be started as a newborn. And we can even argue that it can be started as the child is in the womb. But one simple thing you can do with the newborn is something called neurostimulation. And this is a way to encourage the child to have their tongue up resting against the roof of their mouth. So all you have to do is rub the baby's tongue and rub the roof of their mouth. And that baby will be inclined to start touching the roof of their mouth earlier on. That is a simple trick you can do to encourage babies to not only breathe through their nose, but also have correct tongue posture. Also, another really important thing for the tongue specifically is breastfeeding. So breastfeeding actually encourages the tongue to be in an up position and up against the roof of the mouth. And also as a baby is swallowing when they're breastfeeding, it forces them to use their tongue to swallow. So they have to use their tongue to get milk out of the breasts, and they also have to use their tongue to swallow. So this is really good for a baby's tongue posture. So right now, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding until about two years old. I think this is a good age to keep doing it so that you keep that baby having proper tongue posture. Now, just like breastfeeding is super important, it's also super important to avoid using bottles, sippy cups, pacifiers, and avoid the child from thumb sucking as much as possible. All of these things are gonna be doing the exact opposite of breastfeeding, where breastfeeding actually encouraged the tongue to be up against the roof of the mouth. These things are actually gonna force the tongue to be down and away from the roof of the mouth. And the more a child does this, the less likely they're gonna keep that tongue against the roof of their mouth when they're resting, and the less likely their jaws are going to expand and allow for all their teeth to come in the right place, 
and allow their airways to be open. Now, I know that's easier said than done, right? Because I know a lot of people that have babies and they try all the right things, but the only way they can get them to stay quiet is allow them to suck their thumb. Now, it does take a lot of work, but I would strongly encourage to stop this at least by the age of three. If you can stop it earlier, that's even better. But if this continues after the age of three, then they're really likely to have a lot of these postural problems, really likely to have a constricted mouth, and it's gonna be so much harder for them to correct this later on. Now, sometimes babies can develop a tongue tie. Now, I talked a little bit about tongue ties in adults, but sometimes we can get these in babies as well. Now, usually if a baby has a tongue tie, they will usually clip it as they're born and allow that tongue to have some freedom. Now, this doesn't always work because if you just release a tongue tie, but you don't do anything with it, then that tongue tie surgery is going to develop a scar tissue and that tongue tie is gonna come back. So you wanna make sure that if you do get a tongue tie, so if your baby does end up getting a tongue tie released, that you encourage the baby to do all of these exercises because you wanna make sure they're really using their tongue. It's really important. So I gave some exercises already for adults, but if a baby has a tongue tie and it's not released or it comes back, then it's gonna really cause some issues. So one thing could be that they can't even latch on to a breast, so they can't even do breastfeeding. So this is not only gonna cause problems with their nutrition because they're not gonna get the benefits of breastfeeding, but they're also going to struggle keeping their tongue against the roof of their mouth. And now they're gonna be more likely to have breathing difficulties and narrower jaws. So some things to check on a baby and see if they are able to use their tongue properly is, are they able to stick their tongue out past their lower lip? That's a good sign if they can. If they do stick their tongue out, do you see a V-shaped notch or is it kind of rounded how it's supposed to be? If you see this V-shaped notch in their tongue, then that means that their tongue tie is pulling too hard against their tongue. Also, if their tongue tends to curve downward and extended generally throughout the day, if they have trouble swallowing things, if they have uh, speech problems, all of these things are gonna be contributed to by a tongue tie. Now, another important thing to do with a child to help with jaw development is to start feeding them harder foods starting at six months old. Now, again, you wanna make sure you run this by your doctor to make sure that whatever you're feeding your child is okay. But a great example is carrots. So carrots are very nutritious and they do require some chewing. And these are things that can help develop our jaw muscles and help develop our bones by actually chewing on these foods. I prefer this over all the mushy, softer foods that people tend to give their kids because those foods, yeah, they're feeding them, but they're really not doing anything with their jaw development and then they're gonna further be more likely to have these issues later on in life. Now, another thing that's really important with children is to avoid processed foods. So I mentioned Dr. Price's discovery earlier in this video, and he may have found the link between our modern diet and chronic hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is where you're basically over breathing, where you're breathing too much. So this happens when you are a mouth breather. When you're a mouth breather, you are always over breathing. Anytime anyone is a regular mouth breather, they are chronically going to be an over breather. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So I can talk more about over breathing on a different podcast, but basically throughout our evolution, our diet has been 95% alkaline or basic forming foods and 5% acid forming foods. Nowadays, it's the exact opposite. So Acid-forming foods are foods that form more acid in our body. So that's going to be processed foods, going to be bread, sugar, coffee. All of these foods make us more acidic. And in turn, when we're more acidic, we're more likely to breathe faster. Because the goal of exhaling, the goal of breathing out, is to get rid of excess carbon dioxide, excess CO2. As our CO2 builds up, this produces more acid in our body. So the more CO2 we have, the more acidic our blood is. So if we artificially make our acidity level higher by eating these processed foods, it's going to increase our breathing. Because like I said, the goal of breathing out, the goal of exhaling is to get rid of this excess CO2. And the key word here is excess. Because if we get rid of too much CO2, then this is going to cause a lot of downstream problems and this is going to contribute 
to mouth breathing and contribute to all the negative effects we talked about. So instead, it would be better to eat more alkaline forming foods. And this is true whether you're an adult or a child because the modern diet is terrible. The modern American diet, you can see there's so many processed junk out there that is just not good for us. So adding more fruits and vegetables and even plain water. These are the three most alkaline forming foods that we have. And these are things that can actually control our breathing. So I'm not telling you to become a vegetarian because meat is still okay as well. Meat is still good for you. You need to have protein, but you want to make sure it's not processed meats. A lot of the people that eat meat, they eat these deli meats or they eat these jerkies or other meats that are super processed. And those are going to be foods that are not good for you. They're going to form more acid in our body and they're going to increase our breathing rate and cause all these downstream effects that come from mouth breathing. So in a nutshell, what are the best ways to properly develop the jaw of a baby? Well, we talked about breastfeeding. We talked about proper tongue posture. We talked about proper breathing, how there should be breathing through their nose. And we also talked about their diet. So avoiding processed foods, avoiding acid forming foods, and adding more alkaline forming foods, and adding more hard foods that they have to actually chew on. Now coffee, it's very popular in our culture. I don't know many people that don't drink coffee. I'm one of them that I don't find the need to drink coffee, but I don't judge if you do. But the thing to understand with coffee is that it has an extremely high half-life. It takes five hours for half of that coffee to get out of your system. So what does that mean? Let's say you drink a Starbucks cup of coffee in the morning. 